Hello and welcome to the first programme of the first in the month and I'm Mick Fortune. I'm Robbie Sinnott. And uh, myself and Robbie are going to go on a bit of a journey for the next couple of months. Um, basically, we've got loads of stuff in our heads. We've got loads of stuff on paper. We've got loads of stuff on our phones. We've got loads of stuff on DVDs. That's uh, that's it's no good to us sometimes. It's kind of a it's kind of can weigh you down. Does it weigh you down? Does it? Ah, sure. I'm amazy about it, but it's better out than in. They say about all sorts of things. So I think it's uh, it's good to have it out there in currency and. Uh, to share the wealth, I suppose, because it's from the people, it's from our people, and uh, it's nice to hand it on. And, uh, it's, yeah, and, and that's that's I suppose the reason why we we we've, we've been banging heads over the last couple of years, talking on on the phone. Uh, I'd be somewhere, and I'd be phoning Robbie, and Robbie would be kind of further kind of elaborating on what I've just spoke about, or kind of put into a different kind of context, or put into a timeline. So that's why we're here, and that's why we're with you. Um, and what we're going to do for this first program is we're going to talk about birds and animals, the kind of general kind of folklore around birds and animals. And today is the 1st of February. It's a St. Bridges Day. Um, and uh, I suppose there's a... Great a animal lover. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And there wouldn't be, a, there wouldn't be a, a dairy in the country that wouldn't have a cross probably in her honour. That's right. Well, she was a patron saint of, of, uh, of uh, prosperity and uh, fertility. So that that obviously extended to animals as well, but uh, you know she was herself. Well, she was born at sunrise, and she was born neither in nor outside the house. So she's probably on a threshold, and she was suckled by a cow, a white cow with red ears, and which was a very a sign of uh, being a magic cow. In fact, you'll see that motif a lot uh, in hairs. A white hair with red ears is very sacred or special hair as well. Magic, probably leading somebody to the other world. Yeah. Uh, in in Celtic mythology, so yeah. that's what. And yeah. with Saint Bridget, there's, there's there's so many different things around her. We we we've got our everyone knows we've got Saint Bridget's crosses. We've got different variations of the crosses as well. There's you know different parts of the country where you'll go, you'll have a Waterford cross, you'll have this kind of this this twelve twelve rush cross that we we'd call our or this kind of well, it's not really a cross, it's a trisket really, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um. And she even um. We make it out of rushes, but we you've got something from Mayo. Yeah, I've got a, a man in Mayo that would have recorded, uh, Jim Lally, back in got back in 2008. Jim has passed away since. And Jim uh, was talking about the uh, crosses being made out of metal. Uh, will I stick on a little yeah, bit of listen? Yeah, absolutely. Let's have a listen. St. Bridget's crosses would never be made out of roaches. One time. They'd be made out of tin. Two, two pieces of tin. And they'd be nailed to the rafters in the house when the people had thatched houses because there were no ceilings. And they'd nail them, and they, every year they'd make one. The rafters be covered with them, St. Bridget's crosses. That's interesting, isn't it? But the other thing is because she was also the say, a patron saint of craftsmanship, uh, so because of that, the handiwork, the whole weaving, was a big part of that as well. And she was she was amazing because she was a patron saint of abundance of the heart. Uh, she was a patron saint of child, women giving child, uh, birth to children. And she was a patron saint of poets and learning. And, and the patron saint of the, the defence of Leinster. I wonder will that ever come in handy again. Uh, <laughs> what the, was the defence of Leinster? The, the defence of Leinster, right. fight, uh, fighting on behalf of Leinster. And she was like, uh, she was the, uh, so the Anya was associated with Munster and Macha with Ulster, but Bridget or Brigid was the Leinster saint. Now it's great to hear it. You've got a clip from up in Donegal, which was lovely as well, don't you, about uh, about what used to happen on Bridget's Eve. Yeah, I would have recorded this a couple of years ago. Well, listen, we listen, it's about three minutes long. And uh, What part of Donegal is it? It's up near, uh, God, up near, up near the Inishon kind of peninsula. Oh, I, would really? have, I would have recorded wow. and people were coming from different parts of Donegal. Uh -huh. I was recorded in 2010. Uh -huh. But the, the richness of the ritual is, is really strong compared to other parts of the country. Uh, brilliant. Well, let's have a listen. Well, in our area, the St. Bridget's crosses are made on the, on the feast of St. the eve of St. Bridget's. And uh, you would gather now, the, I know some neighbours would gather together in one house and uh, somebody would go out and say a prayer, you know, before you come into the house carrying the rushes with them. Mm -hmm. And during the cross making, they would have poundies, which is mashed potatoes and onions and butter, lovely butter. Too. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be a cross made for sort of the house and also for all the outhouses outside, you know, the buyers or the stable for the horse or, you know, places like that there to protect the animals throughout the year as well. 
that's the general yeah, idea, yeah, you yeah. know, to win kind of a thing, you know. And if there's any old person in the area that wouldn't be able to make one, you know, you do extra ones for them or whatever, like, you know. Yes, well, I would normally, I still make them, <coughs> and I would cut the rushes off. There was something around the garden where there's plenty, and uh, on the night before the 31st, and I would make my crosses that evening, and I would put them out before bedtime, before 12. And I would have a little bit of cloth, or some them said a white scarf, and I would put it in, I'd put them all into a bowl and put a big stone on top of them so it was a stormy night, they wouldn't blow away, and leave them out on the windowsill all night, and the bridge would come during the night and bless them. And then the cloth would have, if you had any sores or that during the year, sore throats or any sores, especially with children, that you would rub this little bit of cloth on them. You used to have to cut the rushes, the head of the house normally did that, before the sun went down on the 31st of January. Mm -hmm. And then he came to the back door and he called out for the people in the house to go on their knees and to welcome St. Bridget in. And he called out three times and the household answered. And then he opened the door, came in, and then we waited until the sun was well set. We had poundies first. You had the shave of rushes under the table. And then after that, when you had the meal, everybody tied a few rushes around their head, band, something to do with headaches. And then you made so many crosses, depending on how many buyers you had. If you had an old neighbor that didn't make ones, you would make ones for them as well. And we'd normally bless them, somebody in the house would bless them themselves, but now it's the custom taken to the church, but not at that time, when I was growing up a few years ago. Isn't that lovely? That's brilliant. The whole the ritual of bringing in the rushes, uh -huh. the ritual of, even, even the feast, Robbie, the, of the, the, the eve of St. Bridget's Day, that was important too, wasn't it? Just before the, the sun went, before the sun went down, wasn't it? The youngest girl in the house was, uh, she was asked to go outside and come in. And uh, they, she was the sort of the breed dog, almost like the bride. And uh, she was coming into the house. And we, I think you, you probably uh, know more about this than I do, because you've got so much recorded on, on what used to happen. Uh, as just to, to describe to described there from Donegal, there's so many versions of it. And then what they used to do also is put the blue ribbon in, I know in Kilmore anyway, yeah. blue ribbon on the windows. And the idea was that Bridget would uh, see them and say a prayer for them as they, as they passed by, as she passed by. And, uh, you know, that probably also links into the whole cloth because you've got a, a lot of stuff on the Bridget's cloth. The cloth. You know, she, she herself used to, uh, when her cloth cloak got wet, used to hang it, used to dry it on sunbeams, according to, uh, to the legends. Yeah, because you'll come yeah. across a lot of the wells named after Bridget. You'll have little, well, blue ribbon sometimes. The women in Donegal run about a white ribbon, but mm -hmm. you'll get this blue ribbon left out, and a blue ribbon would be left out, and Bridget would come that night as she was passing by and she'd bless this. And that ribbon then would be used for, for headaches, it'd be used for, for cures. I've got a recording of a woman in Clonmel who got a needle in her finger and she couldn't get it out, a tip of a needle in her finger. So she got the cloth and wrapped it around it and basically the, red, the ribbon drew out the, drew out the, 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 the needle. That was the story, right? What's, is there something about St. Bridget too? And the, the, it's before the, 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 the eve of St. Bridget. Bridget. You hang out a rag. Yeah, I know, hang out a rag. Hang out your clothesline. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then St. Bridget is supposed to fly, fly over and bless the uh, rag, the cloth, we'll say. And actually, we still do that. I would never, ever, I always put out a ribbon. And you keep it for a year, or you could keep it for longer, but it's a, you, you tie it. I heard a story once that a lady got, she was sewing, and she got a very fine knitting needle pushed into her finger. And it went up, it broke, I suppose, a bit of it went up. And she, she this was must be true now, she put her St. Bridget's rag around her wrist, and the needle came out um, just below it. Now, and it came out black. And it had been in her in in the skin for quite a while, but she put it down to the same printed drag. It didn't go above this blessed drag, so that was something now that really was meant to have happened. See, oh, I'm going to laugh at that because another thing that Bridget was, she was the patron saint of doctors and healing. So, like, is there anything that she didn't do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. She's amazing. a very ar rounded woman. But the crosses were interesting as well because, mm -hmm. again, I've come across up around Castletown in North Wexford, up around the Macamores, 
uh, a three le- kind of a three legged cross really. It's a contradiction really, but it was yeah. a three three a three legged cross made of, made of the rushes there as well. So yeah. there were different designs ar- around the country. You were saying there was a difference in the north and the south as well. Wasn't I think there? around uh, in Donegal uh, and the tends to be more angular uh, down in the south, or no, not just Donegal in Ulster, but uh, there's there's I think. Uh, it's it's a great wealth of geographical distribution. I'd say somebody like um, De- Kevin Danaher or somebody must have done uh, research on all the different crosses and yeah. and collected them all in in the middle of the twentieth century. But I haven't read that work, which I, I'd love to. But yeah. uh, but one of sure you know yourself, whatever. I know my own grandmother at home. Every every year as children, we'd made our crosses. Like in the Macamores where we grew up, was full of rushes. It was wet, boggy old land. So there was no shortage of rushes. Would you put them up beside the door? Where would you put them? She'd put them up inside. And she'd use them. She'd she'd um. She'd make she'd we'd make them for her and she'd bring them off into Gory. I think there was a bit of a bar, a bit of a system going on. She'd go into the daycare centre uh-huh. with a bag of crosses that we'd made, whatever, uh-huh. and she'd be given out like enough of the wake, she'd be giving them out, you know. Uh-huh. Uh, but they were lovely. She she they'd use them in the house and then neighbours would be farming them, you'd always see you cross over the, in the in, in the dairy, you know, you'd all you'd always see it. And they used the word buyer up there in Donegal, I mean a, a cow house or an outhouse. Yeah. But of course the cows lived with the people up until very recently. I mean my own father lived in a and boy dwelling until he, uh, he was 11 and uh, now they were they were separated off but that's how close people were to the cattle and to the cows and uh, it was very much part of their uh, their existence yeah so, and just to say Olala Bridge Mach Han Tarak Tiach they say in Kilkenny uh, that means from Bridges Day on spring is coming but actually in North Kilkenny they've changed it around so Olala Bridge Mach Han Harry Tiach so the the crops are coming yeah so again, it's all that prosperity and all the all the uh, from here in, yeah. it, things are looking good. The future's so bright, we yeah. gotta wear, yeah, shades or yeah. something. Like that. But you can yeah. see it yourself though. To be fair, like, geez, I found yeah. the last three, the last three weeks were fairly tough. January, the start of January, like uh, the primroses, and you know, it's the first primroses out now. I've noticed the snowdrops are out, the daffodils are out. You know, today, yeah. you know, things like that. You know, I just yeah. and you notice that cock step in the evening, you know, or that that, that stretch in the evenings. Um, in February, just just because we're doing the fe- first of the month, uh, Bridget has, is uh, the first of the month. But there's two others, uh, Finton, on the twenty first, I think. Uh, although in in Ballymore they they they, they dedicate seventeenth of February, but the other lad is Mog. Uh, I think it's tenth of February is Mog, but uh, he's a uh, Aiden up here, isn't he? Mog yeah. and Aiden are all the one. Yeah, Mog. Yeah. For, for any of you don't know, Mog is a great name. You'll still come across in Wexford. Uh, you'll get you'll get it north and south Wexford. Um, he think he originally came from Cavan. There's a Mog's Island up there, but it's my Aid Og. It's a, a young Aiden. It's a pet name. So exactly, a lot of yes. a lot of people will be called Aiden will be called Mog in the same breath. It's a fantastic name, and he he, he left his mark over in Wales as well. There was a Welsh saying called Maydock, and well, wow. Maydock apparently sailed to America, Virginia. That's what I heard. And he was supposed to be, he was the Saint Brendan of Wales. That this. is like the uh, first name that people call their children Maddock from Wales, and I I have I have mentioned this that this is probably from Mog to them, but now they've been met with scorn. All right. But the the <laughs> other thing is uh, the the I think it's also a lot has been written about Saint Vox down in Cairn, which is a holy well. But and Saint Vox's holy day is uh, the holy day of the well is the tenth of February. I'm fairly sure that that's Morg as well. I mean, before we get sidetracked, oh, then, one oh, lovely actually one lovely yeah. thing that, is, um, that I'm not sure you're aware of. Mm-hmm. We mentioned the breed dogs. Now breed dog, what we used to when we were when we were making crosses when we were younger, uh, you'd always have the little leftover bits of rushes, and you'd always make a little dolline with a um, little head, a little uh. dress on her, and and the little arms on her. Wow. And granny, granny home used to always put them up, whatever. But there were, there were there were breed like there, there were mummers. I've got a recording here of some women in Mayo talking about the the mummers as they call them. And the mummer was a general term used for anyone in disguise would call yeah. your house like at yeah. St Stephen's Day or, wow. or Halloween or whatever. And um, did they I, go around in Bridget's Day? They did. And hang on, I'll stick, I'll stick it on here. It's a, there's a, two women in Mayo would record it, and they're going to talk about that. The mummers would come on um, Stephen's Night as a rule. Stephen's Night, they'd have the accordion and they'd dance a set and all that. That's the and mom. then um, in St. Sem- Bridget's Night they come as well. Yeah. And they'd sing the r- rhythm. Here is St. Bridget dressed in white. Give, Give us some, some money to honour the night. Well, the mummers wouldn't have the doll, but the kids would. Hmm. That have the white image, you know. The image in white. The mummers were scarce that time. It's the same as trick or treat now. Do you know how the kids go now? But mm. it's trick or treat now. Here is Saint Bridget dressed in white. Give us some money to honour the night. Isn't that like? Isn't that uh, redolent of the Wren's Day? Absolutely. Uh, give us some money to bury the Ran. Yeah, yeah. The Ran, the Ran, the King of All Birds, and 
it, it's it's amazing. That's that's it. a breed dog. Also, was in County Leash. A breed dog was the name they used for any gate crasher. Uh, somebody who was was an uninvited guest at a wedding, for instance, was called a breed dog. The breed dog is also the Irish word for a bride. But, uh, that's interesting there's so much crossover with even the yeah. terms Robbie like even the, the, the women use the mummers term now, now we associate the mummers with Wexford we have the mummers with the classic mummers play but yeah. a mummer was a general term used for anyone with a mask or a disguise and you'd, people would call oh the mummers will be coming at Christmas or the mummers will be coming at Easter or the mummers will be coming there now the mummers on, on Bridges Day um, does that the, come from England that was Island tradition you know they come around and looking for arms yeah, I, I, I'm not sure, but, but, but it seems to, like, it went on, like, it went on wholesale, like, and mm-hmm. we can start at Halloween, obviously, that, that whole tradition was here along this part of, of, of Wexford, and I'm sure mm-hmm. in loads of other counties as well, um, the, the Ren, the Ren boys, or the, or the Mummers plays at Christmas, people going out, the Christmas Fools. Christmas Fools Christmas and Fool. Cumption, definitely, yeah. and up till the, I was talking to Betty Redmond, and she remembered that she's not, uh, she died about three or four years ago, because yes, she, I guess, uh, I was talking to her and uh, she remembers them going around. Oh, it all finished in the late thirties. She said that the uh, fool, the Christmas fool, they didn't go around wrens at all. There, it was just in South Wexford. They just when I was South Wexford, the wren day was very pop- popular all yeah. over Kilran and Tugboat and stuff. Yeah. But not in Tecumseh, the, the Christmas fool. So the Christmas fools were and that, and that was big in, in America. They were wanting to ban Christmas because they were they were actually they were coming over and they were parading outside the houses of the rich. But that's for another Christmas episode. When yeah, we absolutely. Come here. Yeah. Let's let's pull because we're talking. About, we're, we said we couldn't start. I suppose to do anything without on the on the on the first of February without talking about bridges. Uh-huh. So let's go back to our I suppose our, our birds and our and our and our and our animals, right? Uh-huh. Now, I suppose one of the things. We're talking about cures, or we mentioned about cures, and uh, we mentioned about uh, cures for bit, but the cloth in the hand. Yeah. I came across loads of stuff with animals and bird cures. Uh, one of the things I've come across recently was that my mother always had was that uh, say a donkey, uh-huh. and uh, if an old donkey had a, you'd get him to breed on a piece of bread, and you'd uh, you'd eat the bread, and you, it would cure asthma. Do you ever come across that at all? I haven't, but I, I've come across people putting things underneath a donkey uh, and going around the donkey with it. And as a, a cure for the whooping cough. Oh, brilliant. So that it's, yeah. uh, I don't know, the donkey, the donkey must have had a fairly uh, curative uh, powers. I haven't heard a great lot of folklore now to do with the, with the donkey, apart from the cross on his back. Yeah, yeah. That was supposed to have been from uh, where the Calvary experience or... Or maybe it was Bethlehem. I can't quite remember now. Yeah, no, I've I've got a, I've got a, a lot of stuff. I was sorting basically to let you to know. I was sorting files just to, for for myself and Robbie to meet up, and I found one hundred and twenty one files to do with animals and birds. So we won't get a chance to listen to them all. But I tell you what, <laughs> I found one of my mother, my late mother here, just talking about that donkey, and I'll stick it on for you. Do you let that breed on the? On a bit of bread, and eat it. That's my. A donkey, a donkey. And we're then walking all, under his belly. We're all fucking asses, I think. Well, three times in, in under, under his, his belly. belly. He never under his belly. And you're supposed to be cured. Mm. So I say. We're all fucking asses, my granny said, right? We're all, all donkeys, as we'd say, just part of Wexford, just part of Leinster as well. Uh, walk under his belly, she said, three times, and you, you cure, you get a cure. And did, was there cures with birds as well? I should was there were loads. Though. I'm trying to um, God, uh, we just quick, before it goes in my head. There, there, apart from the cross, there was a, few, a religious one to do with the robin how it got its red breast was that it was taking the uh, thorns out of the crown on the cross of uh, Jesus on the cross, and that's. The blood. Uh, that's the blood then gave it the red breast which is uh, common enough as well still you'll hear, still hear that uh, well I do I've only listened to a woman from Tipperary talking about it yesterday she was saying that's exactly mm-hmm. how, they got, he, how we got it but I think he was uh, God like that that's why that was he went to help our Lord pull the, horn, the thorns out yeah. that's why his breast was red yeah there's a few lovely ones as well actually uh, about the, kind of more kind of unusual kind of ones I suppose to do with um, little snails like the, 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 well, you've, you've, you've what did you, there's different names for snails around around the country, but in this part of, of, of the country, we'd call a snail a, a shelly pookie or a shelly or... Um, shelly pookie is yeah. down in Duncarmac and t- South Tipperary, the Clancy children, uh, they have shelly pookie. Yeah. And they have that rhyme that you had. What was that rhyme that you had? B- uh, basically, whatever, I, uh, it's when you, you've got a... Um, 
I say if, you, if you've got a wart in your hand, the classic kind of one was you get an old snail and you'd uh, rub the snail on your wart and you'd get to, this was my grandmother at home and had it, and you'd get it around the country and you'd stick them on an old skiok and basically when the old snail would wither away, the, 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 the wart would wither away. But one of the things what you do is when you pick up the old shelly, again, the old shelly pookie, we call them, you'd pick mm-hmm. them up and you'd hold it up and it'd be in his shell and you'd say to him, Shelly pookie, show me your horns, Shelly pookie, show me your horns, Shelly pookie, show me your horns. And on the third time you'd say to him, the old snail would put up his horns and have a look at you and then you'd, you know, that, then you'd rub them on your wart and stick them into a skiach and that'd be the end of the snail. Oh, that's a brilliant one. Yeah. The, sna- the snails in the skiach was, was a big one and the thorns, uh, that, that is... Uh, yeah, that's very common. But that the it's interesting the Shelley and the Shelleke. Yeah. That's from the Irish Shellige, uh, which is uh it's the Irish word for snail. And Shellige and the Buki. So the Buki, the Pookie are the horns that are sticking up out with the head, that's what they are. So it's Shellike and the Buki. And uh, so the it's the snail of the horns. You see? So, yeah, that's that's where that come from. And the Puka probably had horns as well. The the ladder used to carry people away and kidnap them and bring them back. Yeah, yeah, Granny had a great word for a little. There's a little beetle, a little um, little shield bug to call. It, I think that's the English term for it. Yeah. But she always called it a shit puka, oh, and, uh, or a stinking ginny to call it. But a shit puka, she mm. called it, and he'd give off a scent when he come up to him. It was for protection. Cool little, little small fellow, but that size. He had key rogues up here as well, did you? We did, yeah, yeah, and 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 gear rogues and key rogues and uh, galyogs as well. Galyogs. Yeah, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Uh, ga- Galshog as well. Anyway, I heard them call it Kalshogs as well. Yeah. That's the earwigs. Yeah. Which is, he wouldn't want to let them lads into you because if they get in, I was three years of age and I thought that one because I must have heard it. Yeah. That one had got into me head, and uh, my granny had me over the sink and, oh, she said I have it here. It's a big one. And she was like, clever enough, you know what I mean? This is the only way to stop me. So, And then when I, when I told my daughter about it and she was eight, she wouldn't go camping after that because she, she was afraid the earwigs would come in and get her. But the efts as well, did they come in? Did you have the lizards or the We did. Uh, newts? I'll tell you what I've got. Actually, we yeah. call them evets. Yeah, yeah evets. Yeah. yeah, evets are newts. And uh-huh. people were afraid their lives of them. Again, where we grew up, but again, this one, the, the Macamores, we grew up in Wexford, was very wet. Uh-huh. So they were always there. They're still there. And there's a difference between the newts and the kind of common lizard, you know. The, the newts lived in, they were, they were, um, they lived in kind of wet kind of like like almost the ground for frogs to thrive, you know. Well, the rest of them lived down by just I think they lived in the sand dunes. If I'm right, it's definitely up around Mount Leinster. But listen, I tell you what, I've got a, I've got a lovely little um, uh, a cure, a lovely little recording of yeah. women in Clamell and women up in Dun- in Mayo well. talking about licking um, licking a frog for a cure and licking a lizard for a cure. Lovely. Hang on, I'll stick it on for you. My dad had a cure. He he licked the belly of a lizard. A lizard. And if you had any sore at all, I don't know if you licked it. it. We had a cure there, whether that was right. But honestly, I remember some of the kids had something when we were young, and he did. It was a sore on her wrist or something there, and you know, after a week it was healed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't like to lick that belly. Well, you just take up the snail and say to him, Shelleky, Shelleky, boogie, put out yeah. your horns, mm-hmm. and when he would, you'd rub him on the wart. I heard tell of uh, a man that just if you got burnt, if the if they licked uh, from uh, an outlooker's belly, they were cured. <laughs> they were cured the burn. I never heard. That. Well, I did, and they done it, and it was cured. I don't know what an outlooker is. It an outlooker a frog? What county is that in? That was recorded as Nina in our Tipperary. Because uh, yeah, the ark is a lizard, and lucre of the lizard of the rushes. And Art Luker, you get the, it's called that all over the, all over the, in Hiberno English, it's called that all over the place. An Art Luker. An Art, Lu- an Art Luker or Art Luker. Yeah. And the, they're both there. And the, the woman down in Care then was with the, down south tip with the, uh, the Shelly Kabuki, uh-huh. with the snail for the, for the ward. But there are loads of things like that. There was another lovely one as well. I remember um, I've come across it an awful lot. I suppose people had to be practical if, if you had animals who were sick years ago and you'd try to fix them the best you could yourself, really at home, you know, there was no, there were no vets. And there's one lovely one that a granny had um, was to do with fowls, sheep getting fowls in their feet or cows getting fowls. They were kind of a scaldy old feet in the, especially in our old gland to be very ah, wet. Wow. And they'd go sore and they'd crack, the heels, they'd, they'd, they'd crack. And uh, basically... That sounds like black leg. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if, if it's technically the same thing. A lot mm. of people said they would have put bluestone on it. Uh, yeah, they would have been crackling in, on the shins of the cow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but did you ever come across Robbie where Granny them the day was to do it? I'll show you a recording mm. where they'd find where the where the the cow would be after walking, and they dig up the sod and uh-huh. they turn over the sod and they'd with a spade and mark the sign of the cross, or they maybe put a few little stones down to mark the sign of the cross. 
Now I've come across that down your part of the county, up our okay. part of the county, and I've come across it in Offaly as well. I think you'd cut it. What's the corner? Ah, oh, the sun sand in the field. field. Put it in the field. Yes. Three sand, corner, sand yeah. in the field. Sand in the field, yeah. That's where it was. Sand down the field. Cut it, sand it. Sand in the field. Three corner. Where? Something I don't know. Back here the fowls. Yeah. What are the fowls? Rotten sheep. Rotten feed the sheep. They all uh, feed probably with that wet toy see. It's gone off. Some of them be bleated to be nearly cracked the grass. I'm nearly cracked myself. Ah, oh, yeah, but we. They must be getting something like that now, too, in the heel. Uh, there was a costume on our lady years ago. That there was a disease called fowls and uh, cattle's feet. Where they get lame and couldn't walk right. And where they'd leave their mark in the ground on the grassy place. The farmer would come along with a little spade and dig it. A little hole, a little square out of it. And put it in the across with stones. And uh, Another one for the fowls was to make a pair of cows standing, put a cross on it with a two shilling piece. And tell me, well, I, I've come across. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick on a clip for you. It's a man and awfully. It's a lovely one as well. About the, you, you probably came across it yourselves where. Um, a poker be red in the iron, there's supposed to be a properties in iron. An iron poker yeah. be red in the fire and it could be put into to milk for a child to drink or maybe oh, sure. for a cow to drink or a calf to drink. But I, You do a lot of things with, with a poker. They're good for getting rid of fairies. Yeah. And changelings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's another one though. Yeah. Well, even yeah. throwing the poker after someone when they be leaving, say if they're going to the fair, I've come across someone, Mum the Mayo, saying they'd be going off to the fair, was, you'd, be, you'd throw the poker after someone for, I think it was for, for, for good luck, you know. Yeah. Or if, if there was somebody after stealing your milk profit on a May Day, uh, if you put the uh, poker uh, in the fire and then put it in the in the, in the uh, churn, Jesus, they'll come running to the door because they'll be actually getting the burn. I think there must be voodoo sort of uh, type, magic type of thing going, thinking going on there. But uh, apparently it worked and uh, they'd be banging at the door asking to stop and that they'd give all the milk profit back. And, uh, well, it's funny you say that. No, I, I wasn't going to plan on showing this. This is the great thing about this kind of program. Lads. It's very, very loose. We have a laptop here with loads of files in it. I'm going to play a file for you now and I'm going to get back to the other one. But I was originally going to talk about was cow with, the cow with red water and the pin. Uh -huh. But this is a man I recorded up in Nina, I've got maybe 12, 15 years ago. And he's talking about the coat, redden in the coulter of a plough, the coulter oh, of a plough. Oh, wow, that's it. And he said that a man would be, you'd be getting bad luck, his animals would be going sick. Wow. And uh, a priest uh, basically told him to do this. Have a listen to this. This man, anyway, he couldn't keep his cows from dying. So he went to the priest, anyway, and he told him. And he said, go home, he says, and redden the coulter of a plough. But the coulter of a plough is now, to, you put it under plough and to cut his scarf along yeah, before the plough yeah. and redden it in the fire and while well, that's redden the man that done that to you will come to you so here your man this man showed up after it's kind of the, the, the coat of getting redden to the, to the red horse and your man came to the door they were doing their job did he the priest yeah the priest did doing that yeah the so woman get the coat and the plough and redden it and well that's redden he'll be coming to you Somebody heard the priest are into the uh, dark arts as well. But in, you know, over over uh, over a, a, a baby as well, they used to put uh, iron uh, as well. And if you put any iron close to it, like even a pin, uh, because it would apparently the pair, the fairies wouldn't come and there'd be no changing. At which, of course, the changing was probably just an excuse for, uh, um, you know, uh, explaining away disability. Uh, you know, it had to, couldn't be us, it had to be the fairies. Yeah. But I think we've strayed a little bit from yeah. animals and birds, but oh, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But no, it's funny about the fairies yeah. putting the, a, a poker over the, or a tongs over the child over the, when you, when you be going out. Yeah. Come here, I'm going to let you listen to this man um, talking about the, the red water. He said if a cow had red water, he said you'd have to take a, a pin out. And it's again, it's that, the reason why I was kind of talking about it was because mm -hmm. it's that power of the metal as a cure, as a cure. Um, and uh, hang on, I'm going to stick it on. Abronine, they'd call it down there too. What would they call it? A bron or a bronine from Irish Buran, a pin. A pin. 
Now here's this man from uh, East, East Offaly. If the cow had red water and uh, you were out in the field herding and you saw her passing the red water, well, if you had a little common pin in your, in your coat, uh, you took it out and you stuck it in the centre of where she urinated. And that was supposed to be the cure. Need the living. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, the power, power, power of the metal again, isn't it? Yeah, it's 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 amazing. But there was there was uh, I don't know. I, I don't. I think it was the magic of the uh, Celtic birds just after flying over my head. Just this something is after you know the birds actually used to, because uh, uh, they used to actually lull people to sleep. Now these were the other world birds. And I think that sort of came over me there, just as it was a, as I went, it was a million miles from a, from a pins and cows there, and all of a sudden, as I heard your man, but these are the vagaries of of uh, of live podcast to podcast. Yeah. Anyway. Can we actually speak, speaking of birds? Yeah. Actually, should we all? We all yeah. There's not there's not a county I'd say in the country that doesn't have superstitions or stories around around, around birds, and I'm sure one of the, the kind of the most common kind of one would be uh, the robin. The robin, because we mentioned the robin earlier on. Now, the robin, I suppose, is seen as a, a bird that will bring news. You now, good news and bad news, but most people kind of focus on the bad news. Yeah. Uh, in the sign of a, the news is a sign of a death, really, is the kind of common one I come across, across an awful lot. I come across in, in personal fact from my own mother's stories to stories that I would have recorded all, all up, up and down the country. Um, like, any, any idea where that, where that comes from, that kind of bird stuff, Robbie? Well, birds is a portentous of weather, probably. Uh, there's loads of examples of, of uh, birds being, uh, the behaviour of birds uh, portending weather, which sort of makes sense. They probably do have a second sense of when it's going to rain and they do react, as a lot of animals do. But, and probably from that, it was seen then that they could probably portend death in, in, uh, of humans too, because there was anthropomorphism. And that's where the Twa Carbys, the song, uh, that, that's the crow knows that this is going to happen. And that's where the magpies, uh, I mean, they, they were seen as, as generally good, uh, but not by everyone. Yeah. So one for sorrow, two for joy, three for girl, four for boy, uh, five for silver, six for gold, and seven for a story never to be told. Yeah. And there's variations of that as well. I've come across variations of that magpie rhyme as well, to where it ends with four, at, at the fourth and fifth one, and it ends with death. You know, uh, um, but even even, our, even take the take the magpie for example. We uh-huh. grew up, and it was a story. It was a neighbour of ours. I was about seven miles away, called Billy Walker, and I got it from Billy's daughter. Uh-huh. And he is saying that he said that there'll never be peace in Ireland if there's a magpie left in the country. And uh, People he, don't know that they actually came to Ireland in the 17th century, didn't they? Yeah, there was no magpies in Ireland up until No, then. no, no. John Derrick had record, record, records that there were no magpies to pluck detached from the roofs. So uh, late six, 1600s, uh, they, they arrived in. They arrived in, in now, here's... The, I'm going to pull up on your screens now so you can see. I'm going to pull up a Google map so you can see the field in folklore from around Fort and Bargy where the story goes that this the first... Dozen, under a dozen magpies landed back in 16, God, 16, 16, 16 70, I can't remember off the top of my head exactly, but there was uh, no magpies bef- before that. And it was uh, a bad time, Cromwell was just after doing an awful lot of destruction to the whole place. So yeah, yeah. He left, he left a fella in Wexford town called Solomon Richards, and Richards wrote an account, and uh, almost word for word, the account that survived in North Wexford, uh, he said basically these magpies arrived in the barony, in the English baronies and the natural Irish, much to test these, saying there'll never be peace in Ireland once these magpies remain. And we associated the magpies with the English, straight from, from, from day one, we associated them with the English. They, they came in, they were a foreign bird, they came in from Wales. Uh, even though poor old Welsh got a bad deal there, we didn't associate them as being Welsh, did we? No, no. <laughs> we supposed to be being English. But they didn't like Wexford Cromwell because of the piracy that was going on right. during the sixteen forties. But Jenny, God, he got his revenge. Yeah. But sure, it's it's it's, it's all so the people put these things together and they they would construct a narrative because they would have to try to make what uh, make sense. Uh, yeah. And and, and the expression Irish, uh, I'm with the point us to, to knock wood out of it to make sense out of what's going on. Yeah. And then uh, I, I can see why that would happen. But uh, the Twack Harbies, and you've got a version of that, do you? Yeah, I have a version of Twack Harbies from uh, Tim Lyons, um, from a, a song. It's a project that myself and Alien would have worked on about uh, seven, eight years ago called Man, Woman and Child. And Child, uh, Francis Child was a collector of songs. He came to England and Scotland, but never came to Ireland. And many of the songs that he collected in England and Scotland or, or elsewhere were still, and are still being sung in Ireland. So here is a Tim Lyons singing the Twack Harbies. As I was a walking all alone, 
I heard twa car bees a makin' a man. The air unto the thither say, oh, where will we gang and dine the day, oh, where will we gang and dine the day? In behind yon old fell dyke, I wot there lies a new slain knight. And nobody kens that he is there, oh, but his hawk is hound and his lady fair, oh, his hawk is hound and his lady fair. <clears throat> his hound is tailor hunting again, his hawk to bring the wild fowl him. His ladies tear and nether mate, oh, so we can make our dinner sweet, oh, we can make our dinner sweet. If he'll sit on his white neck bin, and I'll pluck out his bonny blue in. And we'll lock up his golden hair, oh, we'll touch our nest when it grows bare, oh, we'll touch our nest when it gets bare. Money's the one for him, Max Men, but nobody kens where he is gain. And our is bends when they grow bare, oh, the wind shall blow forever mere, oh, the wind shall blow forever mere. Twa parties. And that was Tim Lyons that was recorded about five or six years ago in the National Library at a concert of Child Ballads. Um, I'm going to get back, Robbie, to the kind of the whole superstitions around birds, birds coming, like we were talking earlier about a robin and a robin being a kind of a sign of a, a, a bringing news, you know, and people, people, people didn't like to see them coming in. Um, my own mother didn't. People said, I've come across people who said that a house would have to be blessed if a robin came in, you know, but it would, uh, you heard the, the, the tapping at the window one. What's that? Yeah, I've, um, a tapping at the window would be, there's a funny one, they'd say a bird would come when someone would die and, um, uh, I've come across so many accounts of robins coming in and when a robin would come in, it would bring news to someone who passed away. And someone who passed away in, in the neighbourhood or someone who passed away a relative over abroad or some part of your family, maybe over in England or maybe in Australia or even America, and you'd, they'd bring the news that someone was going to die. Um, I've come across a lot of re accounts of people talking about when someone would be under, when someone would be sick, a little bird would always be seen at their window. I've come oh. across a woman out in Grantstown in South Wexford and she spoke but it was always a bird seen at the window and the moment that person died that bird was gone um, yeah they, they had to now we had it was much more mundane or prosaic but uh, my granny always spoke well I remember speaking of it was such a matter of fact thing that my granddad used to let a, a wren or a, a robin come in through the window and, uh, and land on his hand and it was on his shoulder first and then it went onto his hand and uh, and just I don't know why this and it has, it has to end tragically, but whatever way the wind was and the bird was going out one day, didn't my granddad shut the door on the window, uh, uh, shut the window on the bird and the bird died, and my granddad was uh, my granddad was uh, quite sad. Uh, he wasn't normally given to emotions, <laughs> but he was actually quite sad for the, for the next few weeks after what he'd done. And, uh, because, he'd killed, because he'd killed a robin. Well, not just any robin, a robin that had befriended him and had come into his own house. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I'm going to I'm going to stick on a clip for you yeah. about. Um, I'm going to stick on two clips. I'm going to stick on one clip first. Is it would have recorded with um, people under in Raheen. Oh. oh, my mother was afraid of a life of Robin. I'm going to be good one. Aye. If a Robin came into the house, she'd lose her life. It was a bad sign. Bad wasn't sign. It? Yeah. She yeah. she had an awful fear of Robin. Aye. No other bird. She might not have other bird. Yeah. Oh, we're going to have a death now. That's that's. Yeah. The same. Yeah, something would have happened. Yeah. It was handed down. A Robin yeah. came in. Yeah. Yeah. And if she hopped around the table, that was. Yeah, yeah. She had, an, she had an honest to God now, and I couldn't. She was pretty for Robin. 
I yeah. don't like a board inside. I do not. Nor tipping on the window. No, well, I, I wouldn't mind tipping on the window, but if a bird comes in, it's uh, yes. some sign of a death or, yeah, or something. Uh, not so much even that it may be a death, but uh, something is going to happen, like, you know. My, my grandmother used to look after this robin, and it never come back after after she died. She used to feed it with her breakfast. She used to stand on her breakfast tray in the mornings and eat off her breakfast yeah. tray. Mm. And, and uh, but she died. She was bedridden at the time. And she died, and uh, the, the robin never come in anymore. Yeah, a robin, if it's if it's flies into your house, uh, it's bad luck. The minute they go out, you get the holy water and you shake it, and uh, shake the holy water. Oh yeah, you'd nearly have to get the house blessed. Some of them used to get the house blessed if a robin flew in. Do you wonder? Uh, no, we didn't have birds. Uh, well, occasionally you get a bird coming in, all right, uh, uh, rarely enough, and be hard enough to get them out. Because uh, they'd be scared, scared, I suppose. But you know what we had visit our house once? Uh, a swarm of bees. And uh, chases we had to, you know, they wouldn't, you'd think lighting the fire. They actually came down the chimney, decided they were going to swarm on the chimney. And you'd think that that'd be the last place they'd want because the bees hate smoke, like. But this was in this was in June when they'd be swarming, like, you know, I suppose there wasn't much of a fire. But I don't know what, uh, if that was good, bad, or any luck uh, to have bees coming and then deciding to set up home in your house. Do you ever hear bees following when someone would die? Do you ever hear any of those kind of stories? I have a vague recollection of a story that someone told me. Fox, before. I have. Uh, there, there was a man called uh, is Hughes, Michael Hughes from uh, up round Meath and uh, near near uh, Laytown or Betty's Town. And I met him on the Lewis just uh, about four or five years ago. And hello, Michael, if you're listening. As I haven't met him since, so we'd love to talk to him. And he was just uh, lovely to listen to. And he gave the story of when somebody famous, because uh, he'd done the fox a good turn, and at his funeral all the foxes came from all over the place to say goodbye. Wow. And that was in his memory. Wow. Yeah. Isn't it lovely? And even that probably certain animals or certain birds would follow certain families or would be associated with certain families, you know. And That's uh, a bit like, it's strange, our uh, now heraldry wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be a fan of it, but on, on our crest it's, uh, it's, it's the three swans with a silver chain. But the thing about the, the it's that's a very popular Celtic motif, and but that's that's interesting because the idea of trying to trying to capture or trying to tame something that's untamable is the whole idea, yeah. and the swans being, uh, well, we we got about five hundred swans down now on the Cumshin Loch, but there's no great traditions about them uh, uh, down there. From in terms, do you think the swans, people sure used to eat them if they could until that was banned, and uh, yeah. they used to also go to the Salties and down to the Blasket Islands and wherever else they could to get the seabirds as well. To, uh, the, uh, you, only when, uh, when they were desperate, when things were really bad, like in the famine or if they were very poor. And uh, the puffin, for instance, was supposed to have good oily meat and uh, it probably wouldn't be good for the heart, but I don't think they had uh, ideas of cholesterol back then. But then they would, they would puff in eggs as well and the gannet eggs as well were apparently very good. And the, many of them, like if you, anybody remembers Peg, a good lot of people down there in Blaskets would have lost their lives climbing up cliffs trying to get to these... Uh, to get to these savoury, delicious uh, delights, yeah. and uh, maybe the birds for for all their nets <laughs> keep getting their own back. You know? <laughs> but but even, yeah. even things you were we were talking earlier on, you were mentioned about it, peacock feathers. Isn't it funny again? What what's good looking in someone's house is bad yeah. looking in another person's house. Like uh, like I've tons of records of people saying a peacock feather was an awful bad look to bring into the house. When you just told me earlier, you had or right above the, in the parlour, <laughs> pride, pride of place. Oh Jesus! <laughs> the eye, the eye, the peacock feather looking down. Oh, on you, yeah. absolutely! Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I was yeah. wondering what I was doing there. Yeah. yeah, my mother had a great one about the robin and I, I kind of only rooted it out yesterday and I suppose I was kind of uh, it was it, 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 it mentions a neighbour and it mentions about when a neighbour passed away and my father's sister passed away that this robin came in um, can I let you have a listen to it? Oh god yeah. yeah I'll stick it on for you When we were here before I really said it died that morning I was here out here now and this robin flew in no windows open just flew in it went all around the house. And you should always bless yourself in the same time. Be right, you should bless yourself. And I said to Jenny, and Daddy was sitting in there, so I said, Someone want to die. There is none, he says to me. Someone want to die, all right. When Bridget and I came down, found out that I said, Our father was up, died suddenly. So that, that did, that was true. And I told Bridget about the robin. Daddy went to bed. 
and he had a tap on the wind. He says to me, see, what's that? Hello, baby. He had a tap on the wind. And he says to me this. And he heard a knock knock. Come on, he say. What's the say to him? Come here, say, for a minute. But I'll show you what's in the room. A folk and robin in the room. In hiding in the corner. And there's a nice big say to him. We let him out. Next day, I warned the cat in So there is some, if a robin keeps up, you fall in you all day around. There's something wrong. Yeah, that was me. That was my mother talking about a, a bird coming in, announcing death. But sure, I suppose that you were saying, like the bow, uh, for those of you who don't know, in Wexford still, um, north and south, We'd still call the Banshee the Bow and so we close the same in parts of East Carlo and you know. You have it from Castle Dermot in Castle Kildare Dermot. as well. Yeah, in Castle Dermot. In, in uh, Waterford it's the Boyb right. and in Kilkenny it's the Bow Quinte. Yeah. So it's, uh, this is the Banshee for everybody else but she, the Bow is the B-A-D-H-B-H in Irish. She, she's a raven originally and she'd be, uh, her screech could kill a hundred soldiers with fright. And uh, she be she be uh, go along picking up the raven to be picking up and it, oh, the Norse are also have it, <coughs> picking up the bones of dead fallen of fallen warriors and uh, yeah. and then she could turn into a beautiful woman as well shape shape shifting uh, was big, yeah. but uh, yeah, well, it's funny there's a great saying in North Wexford uh, about now shouldn't be saying this now really but uh, <laughs> it's uh, about about the bow like the bow was always the well, actually it was a fella who was a bit a bit a bit turkier a bit. A bit <laughs> A bit you want to keep away from Randy. Said, Randy, yeah, that's uh -huh. the word they said. So that lad would ride the bow and the bow she sat in. That's what the that's what the old people would all say. Granny off I fucking said it. That lad would ride the bow and the bow she sat in. But the bow was a bird, Robbie. Like there's a neighbour of ours. He was a baldoon then. No. <laughs> a baldoon is a baldoon is a type of a, kind of a tomcat. A tomcat, yeah. yeah that's so weird. Uh, but the bow was we had a group of stories. There's a man called John Neil near us in Templeary, and we oh. were afraid of the life of John when our children were growing up. And we said, We're all told John shot the bow in the high trees over by the high drone Kilmock Ridge. And the bow, when he went up to get the bow, the bow was only a, um, a bird. And I've come across John. He shot Mur the bow. The bow, yeah. And I came across John Murphy down in. Uh, Did you get a revenge on him? No, I don't know why he shot her. I don't know why he said maybe we shouldn't lie on him. But he shot her, but said it was only a bird. And that kind of ties in. And that story, you'll still, you'll still hear that kind of whispered in parts, to, parts of Wexford. Mm -hmm. Now, not a lot of people have it, but you always say she, she took the form of a bird. It's like the Cuckullan, sure, isn't she? On the, the, the raven on the shoulder of Cuckullan, the statue. That is exactly. But, uh, Jamie, but, there's, but there's something else uh, about the crow. Uh, what well, you see, that, that's to give him strength as well. But there's something about there's the uh, prayer on Kilkenny. The, the, there's a, a legend of the uh, if crows stop nesting in Kilkenny Castle, that the whole castle will crumble and fall. So it, it's also that they're uh, I suppose they can bring death, but they're also they're, they're also the givers of strength if they're on your side. I say Ireland's ancient days now are kind of tuning in, or they're kind of, they're kind of <laughs> rounding up a few crows to throw into it to keep it going. <laughs> but it's it's funny like. Um, Back to birds because we we got a, we do have a list here, lads. Right, so we're kind of going through stuff based on clips that we have and things that we have. And we'll have to get back to it if we don't uh, we, we get through what we can today. Yeah, no, no, exactly. Yeah. But um, I'm going to get back to the magpie for you. Uh -huh. The like, there, there's so many things around the magpie, mm -hmm. like people spitting on their hands. Okay. Clapping to see a magpie. You've got that clip of somebody doing that, do you? I do have women up in, up in Mayo, and I'll show you in a second. Uh. Uh, but sure, a lot of people, even though they kind of don't believe stuff, they'll still be going along the road and they'll still put their hand or they'll say, they'll salute the magpie, hello, Mr. Magpie, and how's your uh. miss? Or hello, Mr. Magpie, and where's your missus? Because when you see one magpie, you're always on the lookout for the second magpie. Yeah. When you see a magpie spitting your hand, you, you do it yeah. like this. Yeah. yeah. Reckon it's mm. good luck as well. But they say if you meet, or if you first thing in the morning, or if you meet the red haired woman as well, to do it. Mm. Clamp. <laughs> you know. Go on. Keep bed, look away from the room before mm. the day. You know. I used to go to a place to make by on the road to come back again. If they're going to town, they come back. They would go away back. It's not a bit of a make by on the road years ago. Could be, could be nearly in town and they'd see a make by and come back home. We went to town. Back home again. Every event. And then you'd like up with her. If you see Magpie, you're supposed to salute her. Mm. But years ago, they wouldn't go, they wouldn't go any further to meet Magpie on the road. They'd come back.
But that, that tradition uh, developed very quickly then, because if they've only been here for uh, 400 years or 300 years, yeah. you know, that's, that, that took off very quickly. Or maybe it came over, the tradition came over from England. I'd say it came over. I'd say, I, I, I'd say it did come over, because the English have that, that, that rhyme is theirs. Yeah, they do. Yeah, 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 they yeah do. that's theirs. Mm. Now, I'd say we've kind of interpreted um, And you what, what about eggs? Oh, just don't don't get me start, don't, don't get me start, don't get the start about eggs, lads. For rice, there's so much about eggs. But actually, but even but even like not like eggs, I suppose were started started the spring now and a couple of months time now the swallows will be coming back and they'll be they'll be nests and they'll come back to their nests and they'll be laying eggs and they'll be hatching out young ones. But like, it was like it was awful awful bad luck to knock down a swallow's nest. Oh, wow. terrible, like no matter where you go, like in, in the country. That is fascinating. Yeah, do you, yeah, but this is strange that the young lads. Uh, up until very recently, uh, boys of up till up till teenage years would go on. The, the, their idea of fun was to uh, go and rob eggs, and uh, and they also ca- capture or trap birds. And they they used to make something called a clavine, uh, or a clavon, uh, a sort of a bird trap, a cradle uh, out. And they, there was like the instructions on how to do it and stuff in the schools collection. But they, there's people still alive now who remember going looking for eggs. Now what they did with these bloody? I don't know what they did. What would you do with crow's eggs or or uh, or, or whatever? I don't know. Well I, I, well, I know them when we were younger. With my father, we were in a, when father was in a gun club. Mm. So I remember going out, and even if you do this, it brings back mem- memories now. of going out um, shooting great crows, shooting magpies, and I didn't have the gun, but I remember climbing up trees, taking young magpies out of nests. And bring them to a man up the road who then would basically pay you 10 or 12 pence. I remember this is back in the early 80s, early to mid 80s. Uh-huh. And I remember visions going up the road because the magpies were seen as a pest by, I suppose, by, 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 by farmers, you know, this time of year as well. And uh, they would be would bring them up to one man near us called Paddy Redman. A vision to go up with a plastic bag with maybe three, four, five, six dead magpies in this plastic bag. Okay. And calling up, so cycling up the road maybe about a mile and a half up to him. And then Paddy would have a chopping block. A, Big lump of wood with a hatchet, uh-huh. and hey, you drum the five or six magpies, and Paddy would chop a leg off the magpie and hand you the dead magpie back with the with the with the with the with, and he'd give you whether ten or twelve pence. Why? Now it was a cull that the gun clubs were being paid. I don't know who's uh-huh. paying the gun clubs, but I've come across I've come across mag traps. Uh, still, you can still buy mag traps or Larson traps. They're called I think for 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 uh, for catching magpies. But what would the magpies be doing any harm? They were saying that they'd pick the bellies uh, the, the the belly of a, sh- a yo when she get down on her back. Or the eyes of a shark. Ah, uh, do you know that, who that, do that now? It's a great they will skull crows. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They, they, what they do is they go down to the young lambs and they pick out the eyes. Yeah, yeah. So you think that they they be uh, so that's why the whole uh, scarecrow tradition and uh, yeah and the bangers had uh, developed. But Janie yeah. Mac, no, they they'd be awful cruel. Uh, yeah, and uh, even even things as well. You'd see the obviously um, one magpie, even the, with, with the Larson traps that were whatever. I wouldn't be a fan of it now, to be fair. Mm-hmm. But even you, you know you catch one magpie. I've seen them. In, I've seen them on sides of hills and I've seen them in the yards you'd have one magpie in it and one magpie would attract the second magpie and then you'd come in and then you'd kill the second one and keep the first one in it it was always that kind of thing magpies were fierce territorial as well it as remi- reminds me of uh, Nietzsche Nietzsche had a phrase because he was talking about people doing uh, crows and magpies and whatever birds coming down and doing that and he called it he had no sympathy for the poor victims he called it green meadow gregariousness <laughs> and he he, uh, he compared the rest of society to that and he was saying how good these people were which I think that led to fascism well not Nietzsche directly, but yeah. saying how, how how good this is. But well, that's that's amazing that they that they used to collect them. That's uh, yeah. Amazing. Here's the thing about, about I suppose, the magpie. We all grew up with stories that the magpie would eat stuff. You know, yeah. kind of way you take your take wedding rings. That's right. Yeah, yeah, they love trinkets. And trinkets and all shiny. Kind of yeah. Well, actually, I eat the magpie right now. Yeah. To be fair, looking back, uh, I killed the magpies when I was younger, or uh-huh. I catch them. Actually, I don't think I ever killed them. I actually, bring them down to my father, and he'll get the blame for it. He's gone. <laughs> but I do remember whatever bringing, taking magpies down, young magpies, and putting them in my pockets and trying to sneak them away to bring them home. But sure, my father would catch me and he'd kill them, whatever. But that's not. You'd have to deal with them in the other world. You'd have to deal with them in the other world, exactly. But I've, I've got a lovely recording of women from Mayo and from Offaly talking about when you'd see a magpie about um, the magpie taking the money out of your pockets. Hang on, yeah. let, let, let's listen to it. The magpie, if you saw one magpie and you're going off on a journey or into town, put your hand in your pocket if you have any money in it and twist it around, right? Something will happen. <laughs> It'll be taken on you. <laughs> you see a magpie, you turn the money in your pocket. You put your hand in your pocket and turn your money around. That's supposed to be good luck. This is an unfortunate thing that a lot of these traditions, as 80% of the people of this country now living in towns and don't get to witness 
or see any of this stuff because it's, this is a disappearing world um, all these observations and all this knowledge but even like the, 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 the cuckoo was, again um, there was a clip there where we both of us were listening to it earlier yeah. about my own mother's kind of saying that uh, if you didn't hear the cuckoo uh, you were just going to be you were going to, you were going to die you know wow. you, yeah but especially by the end of May if you didn't hear the cuckoo by the end of May you were going to die that year Whoa. yeah and people were always on the lookout to listen to the to the cuckoo, you know. Wow. Um, but the cuckoo was back, I know, in this part of Wexford where we are now, the cuckoo is back around the mountain. People, especially country people, were in tune and they kind of get excited. I was talking to a man last year about the, about the cuckoo, about the cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo being able to hear the cuckoo in, in a townsland that he had, hadn't heard of for 30, 40 years, you know. So it's just like the cuckoo. Mm. Mm. Hardly ever hear the cuckoo now. No. Besides, if you didn't hear the cuckoo, it, when it comes out. If you didn't hear the cuckoo, you're going to die that year. Ah, oh, for God's sake. No. I haven't heard her this three years now, and I'm still here. No, I don't know. The cuckoo comes in April. Somebody coming in. It's been a she thing. sings her song in May. In June, she whistles the tune, and July she flies, flies away. Flies away, yeah. Come in. They're another portender for weather in June. That if you they, there's one from Narka Kenny Nora Laura Sahuch, Er Crown on the Lure, uh Jill Devo is canning a roar. If if you see a, a, a cuckoo on a, a branch without leaves, or it's cold June, then uh, sell your cow and buy uh corn. So I suppose they're saying that it's gonna be fairly bad for the rest of the year and corn is gonna be worth a lot. So uh, I think people took put a lot of store by behaviours, or <coughs> the seagull that was coming, or the seagull, they yeah. call them, uh, coming in, ball and holy murders down in Kilmore, yeah. if they'd be coming in, uh, and they'd be coming in low over the land, the same with the swallows, the same with all of them, yeah. uh, coming in slow, and the behaviour of the b- birds, they say if the swallow was flying high, that it was good weather that was coming, yeah. and uh, there was that, that much behaviour for, for birds alone that you'd be, uh, and spiders, there was another one that... Um, when when smoke comes down the chimney steep and spiders from their webs do creep, that's going. That's a sign of rain. Good yeah. a sign of rain. Yeah, I have a lovely one about a curlew actually from a woman in North Tipperary again about talking about when the curlews here. The curlews coming, you'd know that the weather was a change and hang the curlew cry. Hang on, I'll stick it on for you. And when you heard the, the curlew crying, yeah, immediately the people, it was a lot of callows where you'd have mm-hmm. to take out your hay before the rain had come, yeah, and it was a sure sign you'd have to have it out within twenty four hours, and the deluge would come. Mm-hmm. Even to this day, that still happens. The minute they hear the curlew, curl you, you, and it would lodge maybe on top of a cocky hay, yeah. And the rain would be pouring out of the heavens, yeah. And the floods would come up, and the hay would be all gone on them. And they couldn't get it out, yeah. yeah. And the curlew is a great, uh, what will I say, of uh, bad weather. Mm-hmm. Well, I was speaking to Matt Aaron, uh, somebody from Matt Aaron, uh, on, on a slot that you were doing, just filling in for you last summer. And she was saying it makes perfect sense because uh, the animals do are aware of these things. Uh, uh, in a way that people are not, especially in short-term forecasting. So uh, it's been poo-pooed a lot by people over the years, but actually there's, uh, I mean, we, we know that uh, when cows start going towards the ditch and putting their backs up uh, and, and facing the ditch, well, that's definitely a sign of, of uh, rain coming in. They know it's coming. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we don't have that ability. We've lost, we, we're not in touch with our inner uh, God or Earth or yeah. whatever. <laughs> and when you're milking the fuckers, when they lift their tail, it means they're going to be shiting on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what it is. It's, yeah. it's no, it's a real, it's a real thing, though. It's, Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's uh, an, animals do uh, do can can sense this stuff coming. Another one, obviously, if worms are coming to the surface, it said there's going to be rain. Yeah. If you see frogs out, it's going to be rain. Well, they yeah, don't yeah. they don't like to dry that much. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's, there's there's a good there's a good few now with the spiders coming there's, out. There's a ton of them. Did yeah. you have the spider one now about? Uh, that don't wash a spider down the sink. We'd have one where you'd never, you'd never kill if you kill the spider, uh-huh. it was going to rain. That, that was the one we yeah. were all told as children. You'd never kill a spider. Uh, a little, yeah, because of, because it always rain. Um, yeah, that's power, isn't it? Yeah, but even things like even like we, we would have never done them. Even like as um, God, let's see, the God's cow, like little ladybirds. That's lovely. The, OJ, yeah, Irish, yeah, yeah, the little ladybirds. You'd never, you'd never kill them because the cows, would, the cows would make blood, or you know, something, something happened to stock at home, whatever, anything you'd have, or the animals you'd have at home if you killed a ladybird. Um, and they were kind of common. Like the one, the one that I was going to show you was um, about the swallow, uh-huh. and because it's, I've always loved the swallow. I always, I, I try to, I've always trying to figure out are they an Irish bird or are they an African bird, and uh-huh. the. They're just I just love I love them to come. I kind of it gives me kind of a bit of hope that the year is we have another year again. You know, uh-huh. and the summer is coming again, 
Um, and like the nest, I've seen it. I was only up, up near, um, about a couple of miles from where we are now. And there was a woman, and she said there was a Romanian man out painting the walls for there last year. Yeah. And there was a swallow's nest. Now they always had it. We always have the tradition to swallow's nest. You never never knock down the swallow's no. nest because the cows will make blood. And that was a Good kind grief. of common story around. I'll let you listen to a sat one or two examples of that now in a while. And that was you find that around the country, and they never they never do because the cows will make blood. But this Romanian man would not touch the swallow's nest because he had it in obviously in, in Romania. And it was in Brittany during the summer, and the same thing again. A man in Brittany that I knew, uh, again, he moved the car out for the summer because the swallows would come and they'll come into where the, the back of the nest was and they should have shine on the car, really, you know. Good so grief. he pulled the car out for the summer and leave the swallows alone without touching the nest. Uh, I, I learned about birds not to knock them off the house, so I'm lucky. But I, I, had, a, I had a misfortune. Of, I was fed up with them going in our gable end, and I was about to make the tea one morning at the breakfast yet. Yeah. And God, I said, these birds are terrible. Yeah. And I got a big long stick and I had the tea brush in my hand and went out and knocked it up. And the bird left a message on the top of my head. <laughs> and I ended up with a sore throat and I blamed for interfering with the birds. <laughs> and to this day, I said, I never knock a bird off the no, house again. No. <laughs> that used to go on. But they are terrible in the houses now. I find yeah. them terrible. I think there were 14 nests in our house last year, but they're going to stay there. Mm. The only thing I ever remember was if a swallow built in the cows, right? They wouldn't interfere with the swallow's nest because if it did, the cow would make blood. You, you couldn't, the uh, farmer wouldn't let you interfere with the nest, whatever it was, or whatever they built, stay there until the flitchings were ready to go. I mean, it put out to say that the cows would make blood if you interfere. Um. And I'm, I met a woman recently and she said that her daughter, um, it's a funny one again, it's about birds and spirits and connections. And she said that they were living, they were doing up the house and they were living in the old outhouse during the summer. And uh, they wouldn't knock down the swallows' nests, the swallows were in it, and they put bags up to stop the swallows shouting down on where they were living. Mm -hmm. And during that summer, didn't her own daughter, young daughter, get sick out of the blue some illness came and she she passed away and come september the swallows were leaving again gathering they'd always you see them in the country you'd always see them gathering on the lines and they'll always be practicing and scooping around for, for for days and weeks and she witnessed them all gather and then they left and they left one little one you know sometimes they bring out a second batch mm. so they left they left one swallow and she said always oh, associated the uh, that swallow with her daughter. She said the daughter ah. didn't, didn't, didn't want to didn't want to go, you know. And it's funny that she remembers the you know, the swallows come back, it always brings that memory back for her, yeah. you know. Um that's amazing the patterns that people will see in, in and it's it's part it's it's because it's part of our environment and especially in the country and the ritual, the year the yearly cycle, the annual cycle, it isn't as visible at all in, in cities and I think something that humanity is definitely losing as it becomes far more urbanized. Yeah, and we're out here in the middle of the country. It's, it's lovely now to be. Uh, it's lovely to be back out in the country. <laughs> back home, yeah. <laughs> but it's funny now. There, there were kind of comparisons, which is there, there's room. You know, I, I we'd be working with a lot of traditional singers, and we'd be working with Dublin singers, and we'd be working mm. with like Fergus Russell or Luke Cheevers and these fantastic urban singers. You know, mm. and uh, it was funny. You'd almost draw parallels. You know, you'd have you'd have Jesus. You'd have you'd have the songbirds in Leinster or Munster, uh -huh. but then you'd have the Dublin. You'd have the crow. But you know what? There's room for an old crow on top of an aerial or a roof singing as well. You know that kind of way. Yeah. That, and and they've got their own particular style or their own particular squawk or bark or whatever it is. You know that kind of way. Uh, just gorgeous. Um, cog. They have it. Is uh, it? Cog is one word I heard for it. Now, uh, yeah. Now there's a, there's a one. I will shine in the heifers. Ta ta ta. Chertri kiri. That's in in a in a in a poem from Kerry in, in uh, Goggly Gog or one of them um, uh, children's uh, things that they did. But a uh, cog I've heard in Wexford as uh, the co the crawl of, call of a bird, and there's another one called boudre boudre. It's a it's a type of a call of a bird, but I haven't a clue what the bird is. It's a mad thing. I'd love to find yeah. out if anybody knows. Did you come across? It was funny the way. Uh, God be good to the God be good to the English there now. Whatever. There were loads of because your whole area of expertise is the Irish that was spoken in in in, in Wexford. And it's an interest we've all these words that we grew up with Irish words, even though we we're talking I'm talking English and you have Irish more than I have. But we had loads of words. My grandmother had tons of words, Irish words, that she had that they were never they never they never left 
the, the vocabulary. Like, simple things like brush, brush and skiox and things like that. But words for earwigs, uh, g- uh, gearogs and gal uh, galshogs and. But even the, for the birds, like the spidog is used uh, in Wexford still for a robin and. La, la Droline is still used for the render look the Droline well not, not in English but the yeah. Droline Droline a Droline is used in midwest for Droline yeah and the Kreesk any month lads Kreesk Kreesk they always say Kreesk oh Granny oh, they're, they're Granny Kreesk this is, is like, the Grey Heron Grey Heron yeah the Kreesk now yeah. the Granny Kreesk but now down in down in South Wexford she's also the Kachi and uh, they have the Kachi Rua in, in East Galway as well but uh, it, where Irish is now gone from yeah. But we still have the Kachi in the, in the Granny Karisk, or Granya Karisk. Uh. And what would you call him there? Uh, no, Granny Karisk. Karisk? Yeah, we call him Karisk. Uh, but I think a, a herring is probably the proper name, or herring. But we had calls for birds, like so. Yeah. Uh, in Wexford, they'd, they'd still have a tuk, tuk, tuk for a hen, yeah. badly, badly, badly for a goose, um, and you'd finach, finach, finach for, uh, for uh, ducks, yeah. and you'd loot, loot, loot for a duck as well. Yeah. But yeah, there was, uh, there was. I'm just trying to think, there was one... Oh yeah, well, you had one for pigs, but we'll go talk about yeah, well, we, we, we yeah, it. Yeah, well, it was Harris Jock, and people who call mm. in, call in a pig Harris Jock, Harris, Harris Jock, Jock, yeah, Harris Jock. And then the, in the other parts, like the, that's also become Harish and Harish, and it's become Chach. My father would say Chach, yeah. Chach. Yeah. So they just split, they split it up and break it up. A bit. Let's forget yeah. about the pigs. Tell you what I want to mm. do, right? It was uh, we we'll go we we'll go, we'll go back to the hens. We were talking about gluggers, uh-huh. and uh, for those who don't know a glugger, when a hen is setting, we've hen setting at the moment here, rarely, right? And when a hen would be setting, you would be setting for the, whatever, the 20, 21 days would bring out the, the clutch. But people, when, when a setting hen did put 13 eggs on it underneath them, well, and it was awful good luck for 12 of the eggs to come out, whatever. Either. And you do certain things, because we, we have hens here, and when a hen's be setting, the other hens would come in to fucking lay an egg beside her, right? Okay. So you don't know which hen egg she's been sitting yeah. on for the last week and a half, and it gets messy for the poor old hen. Yeah, so there was a lovely little, yeah, there was a lovely little thing that they used to do, and I'll tell you, I'll show it to you. It's a little recording after Mayo, about uh-huh. marking the sign of the cross on a Hen, well, a hen's egg. You get a few eggs, what was it, about 11, and put them under the hen, make a little sign of the cross with soot out of the chimney on the egg, and let her off then. <laughs> when you put down a clutch of eggs long ago under a hen, there would be 13, there'd have to be 13 in it, or for some reason or other. And maybe one would be a glugger or something. So most of them would come out, but uh, it would be 13. Oh, yeah. Maybe since the neighbour's house yeah. for them, the clutch of eggs. And another thing, when they put down a clutch of eggs... That's right. If they came to under the... There'd be no the, birds the gluggers, is it, or the past gluggers, is it, the call And if there was any noise, and a kind of, say, a hammer was any kind yeah. of... Yeah, drilling. Noise, drilling around them, you know. Or maybe sometimes a hint, if you put down a clock on him, we call it. And the clock and my daughter, and she be, we, you think she'd be there and she'd be gone, and the eggs have been there, but it's cold as ice. Yeah, remember? and the luckiest thing in the world was the one that hatched out and then came in with her nine chickens. That's right, yeah. It yeah. was awful lucky to Sometimes see her coming from know. under the hedge and you wouldn't know where you she came from. You wouldn't know where she came from, and the chickens would follow her in. Follow her in, yeah. and she'd be delighted. Oh, stop, yeah. When, I, when, when you would go to like tits and eggs, see where there's chickens in them. And you'd get the candle and you'd hold the candle in like that. We had get someone to hold the candle for you and you hold up the egg and you put your hand that way, do you see? And then if it was black, there was a chicken in it. And if it wasn't, it was clear. You see? <laughs> That's how we knew it now. <laughs> so the glugger comes used to, is an Irish word for? Glugger is a rattle. A rattle. Glugger bosh, uh, that rattle. Wow. And uh, yeah, there's just a good lot of uh, old Irish words. Yeah. Now obviously you know that you put an egg and if an egg floats, it's 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 bad. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but I suppose the glugger would. But another word for it used in Leinster, it's called a, a bugon. A uh, bugon is is it? Well, that's uh, uh, that's actually a shellless egg. So eggs that were born with no shell or that were laid with no shell on them. Yeah. So there's there's still about as well a bugon. Yeah. We we didn't find as well when the hens when the when the young hen, young chickens here would be laying first. You'd always get two. Um, Two yolks in the in the one egg, you know. Oh, really? Yeah, be, be, be fierce, fierce kind of good luck, you know. Cheney, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that's it's a I think we we need to end this uh-huh. ramble. Uh, I used to go back to Dublin. <laughs> you used, to, used, to, used to go back to Dublin. Basically, I, I want to thank you for for listening. Uh, I said this is a this is a, a trial. It's the first. It's basically emptying our heads out of stuff. 
Uh, we could talk for hours more, um, and we could, we could, but we we can't. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're going to probably do, we'll do the bird one, or the animal one in a a week a week's time or so. Uh-huh. So in the meantime, whatever I'm going to, we're going to say good luck to you, and sure we'll if you want to tune in next week or the week after, whenever we're doing it again, uh-huh. tune in. We have a few left. Yeah, mm-hmm. we'll end with a song. It's a, a song by um, a, a song here by Morris Layden it was recorded in Derry at the Bird Song concert back in 2015, and uh, it's a song called uh, "The Turn and the Swallow." So we'll end with that, and sure we'll uh, we'll be seeing you again. Slána gai, slána valja. Anyway, this is a song from uh, Lily Koenig uh, called, uh, what is it called, The Turn and the Swallow. Mm. There's plenty of birds in this one. <laughs> when the cuckoo is called in Norwood land and valley, and the turn and the swallow flies over our bay, then it's longing I'll be for the land of my father, where ban and the black water sweep down to Loch Ness. A home I have made in the land of the stranger, tis many long years since I've left Derby Still an urge makes me follow the turn and the swallow where bar and black water sweep down to Loch Tis grand is the Rio and fast the Ohio and wide the Missouri of mention I'll make. Still Urge makes me follow the turn and the swallow, where ban and black water sweep down to Loch So soon I must part for it is my last journey, for my eyes they grow dim and my hair scarce and grey. So soon I must follow the turn and the swallow, where ban and the black water sweep down to Loch I long for to see the dark waters of Loch I long for to gaze on sleeve gallant. And I long for to follow the turn and the swallow, where ban and the black water sweep down to Loch And when I return to my native isle, in the spring I'll hear the cuckoo sing round sweet Loch and I'll be out watching for the turn and the swallow where ban and the black water sweep down to Loch So adieu to the Rio, goodbye the Ohio, farewell Missouri so far, far is a cairn in the land of my father where